good morning uh, everybody uh, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on equalization levy uh, a detailed analysis which we intend to do to you over the next uh, one hour uh, clearly uh, the fact that india probably is one of the very few countries if anybody else is there in the world which has sought to impose a new levy in the midst of a pandemic itself shows how much the impact that equalization levy has had globally it's been a subject matter of several discussions the reason why we are doing this webinar today uh, post the announcement of the chalan under which payment of equalization levy can be made a couple of days back is because there was a fair degree of expectation that the government might either postpone the levy uh, maybe by 6 months by a year or may wait for the faqs to come out explain the provisions and thereafter only would the levy be imposed a uh, no such thing has happened we do not have any uh, faqs as yet we do not have um uh, any sort of clarification on number of things which arise but nonetheless we have looked at uh, a 7th of july as being the date on which the first payment was to be made with people probably not being ready a uh, people still analyzing the provisions and we thought it was important uh, at this point of time to share our thoughts on equalization levy what are the issues which arise what is it that we need to look at and if i can jump straight into the 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 presentation uh rishi if you could go to that so over the next about an hour or so uh we are going to talk to you broadly about the digital taxation global levy uh, what what exactly is happening around the world on the, in the field of digital taxation what is the overview of equalization levy my partner and colleague rishi thereafter will do a in depth analysis of the impact of equalization levy on certain types of transactions so there are certain sectors which we have picked up and there are certain type of services certain arrangements which we believe are very very relevant for us to understand we are then going to talk about the other issues which arise the appeal and assessment proceeding etc and what do we take away from this webinar what is it that the companies who are impacted by equalization levy need to do uh, uh, going forward we have some time for question answer uh, uh, towards the end so do keep your uh, uh, questions coming to us on the chat box and we'll be happy to uh, respond to them i have my colleague uh, ajay roti also on the call and he will pitch in uh, with his experience uh, with rishi uh, uh, either in terms of uh, explaining any of the provisions or Uh, in responding to the questions that you have so we look forward to a very hard core discussion where we are diving very very deep into the issues which arise what is it that we need to do and how do we take our journey on equalization uh, levy forward i may also mention that even today as we speak there is an expectation that probably the levy might be postponed but as they say hope cannot be a strategy we have to plan today on the basis that the levy is indeed going to be imposed we have to deal with it and that's what we are going to do as we go forward rishi yeah the next slide rishi yeah the next slide yeah so uh if there is a field in global taxation which has maximum amount of controversy has been spoken about the most it is indeed digital taxation suffice to say that there is a universal acknowledgement that the traditional definition of the permanent establishment rules are not equipped to deal with digital presence which is not a physical presence and therefore how does one deal with a digital presence when the heading of the article 7 itself speaks of permanent establishment clearly uh, there are issues out there I remember it was around October 15 that when the BEPS uh, first report started coming out and action item 1 was on digital taxation there was a huge amount of discussion to say there needs to be a global consensus on digital taxation if there is no global consensus there would be multiple taxation and then there would be issues around the world there was a common acknowledgement that unless 
the global players came onto a common platform and were able to work out the basis on which digital uh, transactions can be taxed one could not really do anything meaningful forward the action item 1 indeed spoke about three alternative methods in which a framework was evolved where if one of the three methods or a combination of those three methods could be a basis on which digital taxation could happen india believed that digital taxation one could not wait for a consensus to emerge and without waiting for that consensus to emerge when the finance act of 2016 uh, was was passed we had a uh, equalization levy being introduced and i do remember that globally there was sort of a a, a big amount of uproar to say that even the ink has not dried on the beps proposal why is india in a hurry to introduce equalization levy we need to wait for a global consensus uh, articles were written all over the world however while india may have been the first to impose equalization levy it was not the sole one there are several countries around the world who have imposed uh, uh, digital tax in one form or shape of the other um and indeed it has become a source of dispute primarily between usa and the european union and it is very easy to understand usa stands to lose a substantial portion of its tax base if the countries around the world european or developing countries like india were to introduce a digital taxation which again could not be credited in usa so usa and donald trump in particular have sort of weighed in very heavily to say that these transactions can be taxed only in the country of residence and nowhere else that's a digital divide as i would call it and the digital divide is primarily protection of your base of taxation you are trying to protect your source and you don't want somebody else to eat into that that said while usa has initiated an investigation as to whether the digital tax measures introduced by a number of countries constitutes unfair trade practice us has even threatened uh, as it did in the context of france to go back and say that they will impose a uh, duties on imports made from those countries uh, unilateral measures continue unabated and are unlikely to end up very soon because digital co- commerce has grown multifold now in the light of the pandemic and it cannot be that usa which houses many of these companies is the country which is going to tax all the transactions and none of the other countries which provide that source of income are really going to be eligible to any part of the taxation uh, next slide so india introduced equalization levy as i men- mentioned in the finance act of 2016 the levy was at 6% uh, and indeed at 6% probably we are the highest uh, uh, in terms of what tax could be imposed uh and the tax was on online advertisement digital advertisement and related services from specified persons uh uh the the similar rates which have been imposed by other countries within eu vary between 2 and 3% india at 6% probably is at the top end however one important thing is that the equalization levy originally in 2016 was a tax which was required to be paid by the resident indian who was making those payments for online advertisement or digital advertising or whatever else the non resident was only supposed to charge the tax it was to be collected so it was sort of a pass through unless of course the balance of trade was such that the receipt the provider of the services agreed to bear the tax uh, itself otherwise the tax was recovered and we have seen that generally Uh, almost universally that in every such transaction the foreign non the recipient of money is leaving the tax and paying over to the to, to the government and therefore there was no really loss of revenue what has now been done in the uh, uh, in the current uh, finance act of 2020 is to amend the provisions of finance act 2016 ala service tax you know where more and more services went on getting added to the to the levy of service tax uh, and uh, uh, what has been now provided is that 
any e-commerce supply of goods or services by a non-resident being an e-commerce operator will be subject to an equalization levy of 2%. The levy commences effective 1st April 2020. And as I mentioned earlier, the first payment was in respect of transactions from April to June to be made on 7th of July. Well, Rishi will take us through the nuances of each of the items. Very, very broadly, what the levy encompasses is either an online sale of goods or an online provision of services or an online sale of goods or services being facilitated by an e-commerce operator, sale of advertisement which targets an Indian resident customer or a customer who accesses advertisement through an Indian IP. And as you can see, even as I speak, the number of things which need to be interpreted are because there is no guidance available at this point of time. And finally, the sale of data which is collected from an Indian resident or from any person who uses an Indian IP. So if there is an online provision of goods, services, or somebody facilitating it, or advertisement or data sale, all of that is a subject matter of EL, provided that the recipient is a person who is a resident in India. So if a person who is a resident in India buys goods online or avails of services online, then the subject matter of that goods or services is liable to a 2% tax. Or if a person who buys goods or services uses an Indian IP address, and again, while, while Rishi will take us through the various nuances, the applicability of the levy is in respect of even a non-resident who may be transiting through India, who buys goods or services which may be supplied overseas, but the address which is used is an IP address in India or a receipt by a non-resident of offshore sale of advertisements which targets Indian customers. And again, issues of what targets Indian customer, what does not, we all need to uh, interpret. And finally, where the data is collected from an Indian resident or from a person who uses an Indian IP address. Again, as Rishi will take us through, each of these terms is capable of myriad interpretations. And the reason why we have a huge degree of ambiguity here is that there was no equalization levy which was proposed in the finance bill. It is only when the finance bill was moved on the floor of the parliament on 23rd of March to enact it into a finance act that it was a government uh, uh, amendment to the finance bill where this was introduced. There are very, very few, if any, precedents where a finance bill is modified through a government amendment to impose a new levy. But that apart, the fact that there was nothing in by way of a draft, there was no ability to make a representation. There was no ability to put points of view meant that we have provisions which if I may dare say are very ambiguous which are maybe half baked if I may call them which we now need to interpret. Next slide Rishi. Um, the provisions do not apply under certain circumstances. So if the e-commerce operator has a permanent establishment in India and the supply of the goods or services are effectively connected with such permanent establishment then equalization levy is not applicable. Now, what, how does one decide whether there is a permanent establishment in India or not? There are several, several cases, for example, where non-residents have received orders of assessment where the tax office is alleging a permanent establishment. And you know that when the tax office alleges a permanent establishment, they virtually throw the kitchen sink at you. They will say you've got a fixed place of business and you've got an agency permanent establishment and you've got people and whatever else. Uh, and if you look at all of those things which are in litigation, you are challenging that you do not have a permanent establishment, whereas the government believes you have. How do you 
then come to a conclusion whether or not you are liable to pay a equalization levy, a point to ponder about. There is a de minimis exclusion that if the sale of goods or services is less than two crore rupees a year, equalization levy is not applicable. So if it's just about four lakhs of rupees, the government doesn't want to waste your time. And then items which are covered by 6% rate obviously would not be covered by the 2% rate. Where income is chargeable to equalization levy, section 10 subsection 50 has been introduced, which provides that such income will be exempt from income tax. But clearly, if you don't have a permanent establishment, you have to pay a equalization levy. There could be a situation, for example, that you don't have a permanent establishment, but you are earning income by way of uh, uh, royalties, fees for technical services. There is no such exemption. So you could be liable to both. And there is a one year window where you are liable to both income tax as well as equalization levy because the exemption to charge of income tax in respect of equalization levy commences only from 1st April 21. So for the goods and services sold from April 1, 20 to 31st March 21, you are liable to both the levies because the government wants admittedly to examine how the provisions are rolled out. They do not want to cannibalize 10% rate of tax for 2%, etc. And therefore they want a, a parallel run, so to say, for a period of a year. And thereafter they will determine how the levy should happen. Finally, uh, as I mentioned uh, 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 in the context of the earlier slide, unlike the 6% levy, where the compliance obligation was cast on the resident for making a payment, now it is an obligation which is cast on the non-resident, which itself has a huge amount of issues as Rishi will take us through because now a non-resident who may just be supplying goods to India, who is never liable to tax in India, has no permanent account number in India, how does one discharge the goods, etc., etc. So with that broad introduction, uh, I, I hand over to Rishi to take us through the nuances of the various sectors and the various type of issues which arise in dealing with. Over to you, Rishi. Thank you, Dinesh. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, a very good morning to all of you who are participating on this webinar. Um, uh, well, you know, this the, the subject of equalization levy and digital taxation is is uh, you know, is ever evolving, and we are at a stage where uh, uh, where where it is just uh, growing further, and country is doing their own unilateral measures. But uh, you know, before we kind of jump into the topic, I just wanted to share an example of why governments are looking at equalization levy, why they're looking at having digital taxation, and uh, and, and and the time where we are going through this pandemic. Um, there is also a higher thrust on or a higher uh, e-commerce transactions that are taking place. So if you look in 2019, um, and I don't know how many of you guys are movie buffs, but there was a very, uh, there's a Hollywood movie, Bird Box, by, by an actress, Sandra Bullock. She's a lovely actress. Um, that released on an OTT platform. On, on one of the digital platforms. And surprisingly, it didn't go to any of the movie theaters. But if you look at the analysis, you would find that that movie broke all possible records and it had a worldwide viewing of around 45 million viewers in just 24 hours. So that is the power of, uh, of e-commerce, that is the power of digitalization that, that the business uh, achieves through digitalization. It also indicates that there is a huge shift in consumer behavior. In fact, there are some survey reports which are saying that there has been a drop of cine goers by more than 25% because most of them are viewing um, movies through these um, OTT platforms. So clearly there is a shift in consumer behavior. Clearly, there's a shift in the way business, uh, businesses are operating. And clearly, we are seeing the shift in which the government is responding to such kind of uh, changes in the market and changes in consumer behavior to protect its own tax base. Um, so I thought that was a little introduction that I would want to kind of lay down that why this is such a burning issue. Um, coming to this whole topic of equalization levy and Dinesh gave a, uh, a great, you know, a, a, a brief overview of what the provisions are. 
Uh, but first and foremost, I think an important aspect also to consider is is to go a bit into the constitutional validity of the levy. Now we can have you know this levy was brought in as by the by an amendment to the finance act. The, and one really needs to see that is the parliament really empowered to bring in uh, this levy? If you look at the constitution, we have Article Two Forty Six A, uh, which kind of empowers the government to bring in such taxes. But those taxes are more in relation to goods and services tax, and we already have a GST in place, uh, and there is a GST by way of OIDAR services. So therefore, you already have uh, a GST on such on such uh, transactions. So therefore, it may not really be possible, and we can argue this to say that the the levy itself is constitutionally invalid, as the parliament is not empowered to bring in an additional levy like equalization levy. So that's one thing which one needs to keep in mind. The other aspect of the levy is this. Of what we call extraterritorial uh, aspect of the of the levy, because what is happening is that the levy is the obligation to discharge the levy is on the non-resident e-commerce operator. Now, non-resident e-commerce operators all outside India. So, can we say that this levy is extraterritorial? Well, there have been certain cases which have said that uh, the Parliament can bring in laws which can have extraterritorial uh, application but there has to be some level of nexus for um, for it to bring such a law now the nexus theory itself can be a, can be debatable um, nexus can really be can really be drawn up when there is some kind of source um, of income arising in india um, Today, the way the levy, the way it is brought in, it seems to have targeted nexus only on the basis that there is some resident user in India, which is which is uh, using uh, uh, or or is using online transactions. Now, it can be argued that mere residence cannot be the basis for bringing in uh, the levy. Say, so take for example, if you were traveling abroad. And you purchase uh, goods from a store in in uh, from abroad, then that transaction is again not liable to any taxation in India because it is extraterritorial, and you are still a resident just traveling abroad on a visit. So merely by having a resident in India, can it be said that the levy uh, is is permissible and is not extraterritorial? I think this is something which would be uh, highly debatable and a view could be taken that the levy is extraterritorial. But having said that, I think um, a lot, uh, you know, nobody would really want to uh, plan around it or just uh, hang on the expectation that this would be constitutionally invalid. Um, so, but we can, you know, having said that, we might just, we'll just jump into a bit of the impact analysis. Um, around the levy. Um, now, why is there so much of a hue and cry around the levy and the wide interpretation as as that 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 the levy has? Um, as Dinesh spoke about, with when you look at the very scope of e-commerce um, supply and services, it covers an online sale of goods, uh, online provision of services. Um, there is also, uh, you know, non-resident to non-resident transactions on on ad sales, etc. Uh, but a lot of the aspects, a lot of the points of the levy on the definitions are not very, very clear. So let, let you know, if you look at the very definition of an e-commerce operator, it talks about a non-resident who owns, operates, or manages. Now, when you look at owns, operates, or manages owns can possibly be easily explained but how do you really look at operates or manages there's no real definition that is there for this um, if you look at the dictionary meanings and also some precedents where you see in the context of ATIA, it really talks about operation and managing where you where, where you are in control of the entire show 
So when we really evaluate if you're an e-commerce operator, you would ne nearly need to see whether you're in control of, of the, the platform that is there with you. Now, the next subject is that how would you look at digital facility, electronic facility, or a platform for an online sale of goods? Now, these words are again very ambiguous um, and it could be subject to multiple interpretations. It could even, it could be as simple as using an email facility to communicate with a client using some kind of facility for enabling uh, delivery of uh, services as, as, uh, as covered within the meaning of an uh, e-commerce operator. So therefore, there is a lot of um, ambiguity around it. Again, when you see the definition of online, and that's one of the things which is defined, it is again very wide. It talks about uh, a facility or a benefit or access which you obtain through the internet. Now this again is, or, or any other form of telecom network. Again, very widely worded. Uh, so therefore, all these aspects are leading to a lot of uncertainty. And this would only mean that the levy can apply across businesses, businesses which operate with even some degree of digitization could also be subject to the equalization levy. Uh, one expected for some FAQs to come in to clarify the scope. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have any FAQs and uh, one will have to wait and watch what really comes out in those FAQs if and when released. Uh, but having looking at the legal framework, uh, it seems to be quite wide compared to the intent with which the levy has been brought in. So there is, a, a, so to say, a tug of war between what is really the intent of the levy versus the entire uh, the legal framework or the legal provisions that have really come in. So, so I think that's the next, I'll move on to the next slide. In terms of the potential impact, the way we look at it, I think this has a potential impact across all sorts of online transactions. It could apply to your, uh, to, to, you know, uh, clearly the intent has been to, to apply it to an online marketplace. Um, so you have lots of um, online market players uh, operating. Um, so clearly the, the levy is for applying to them. But it could also apply to a wide gamut of other businesses. Um, as I spoke about the OTT platforms, so it, it has an impact on the entertainment and media and entertainment business. It could impact um, online courses. Um, our kids today are all uh, busy on Zoom as we are busy on Zoom on this training, doing some online schooling. That's a different thing. All the schools are from from uh, from are out here in India, uh, but there are many such online education courses which people pursue uh, from from a, through abroad. Um, it can also apply in case of um, software distribution uh, arrangements. Um, you uh, a big impact is probably on how it works on the hospitality and the tourism industry. Um, again, on financial services also, um, and uh, even internally, where many companies have intercompany arrangements uh, and cross charge arrangements, it could even apply to those sort of services. So as we go into, yeah, we we try to cover. Um, an example to show how each of these businesses are impacted by the levy and what are the typical issues that could really arise out from each of these uh, from, from the levy. So that's, uh, that's a broad snapshot of the impact that is there. Um, now, I could just look at, if you look at the first uh, case study kind which we've covered is where we're talking about the distribution of software. Um, now, this is typically a reseller model where, where a lot of the software companies uh, do business with India. You would have uh, a local Indian company, which would be the, uh, which would be the, uh, the distributor. Uh, that distributor would basically be uh, placing orders on, on the foreign company. Um, and those orders could be placed through some on, internal online tool. Um, and, and then uh, this, there is a sale transaction undergoing with third party distributors and an ultimate sale to the consumers. Now, this, if you look at this model simpliciter, 
how would you see can you say that the foreign company which is uh, operate can it be considered as an e-commerce operator can it be said that it is operating an electronic facility because uh, in many cases what you would see is that uh, the 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 platform or the tool on which uh, such orders are placed are not really owned by the foreign company um, it could and it's not even in a way so to say that the foreign company is in control of such platform or such facility um, it, it also you would see in many such cases that uh, the the transaction of online sale is not really happening because the contract is some the distribution contract or arrangement between the indian company and the foreign entity is offline it is only that you are utilizing the platform for if for facilitating the delivery or 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 specifying the requirements that you have and not really so to say engaged in an online sale of goods or services a burning issue has always been uh, how the entire uh, uh, you know payment for software transactions are to be treated from a tax perspective um, the, there is uh, ongoing litigation on whether a payment for software qualifies as a royalty and subject to a withholding tax um, under the act or under or is it exempt under the treaty uh, we we've already had uh, the samsung case which is pending at the supreme court and um and till till uh, till the supreme court comes out with its verdict on how it sees royalty taxation what would be the impact of the levy um if you uh, so this could have uh, you know two possible outcomes and as dinesh highlighted in the beginning that the equalization levy and income tax will apply uh, for at least a period of one year so there is an aspect of dual levy and income tax withholding as well as an equalization levy for the first year um, and and where where there are so for and one will really need to see what position they have taken on royalty payments so if people have taken a position that the royalty is not subject to withholding in jurisdictions um, other than uh, uh, the state of karnataka then there could possibly be no withholding tax but one will then test equalization levy uh, in in a jurisdiction like karnataka probably you will have uh, the equalization levy as well as uh, the withholding tax both applicable um, that that could be the position when you see uh, the period for for the current financial year but when you move to uh, a period of uh, if the next financial year the equalization uh, levy will need to be tested uh, because there is an income tax exemption that is available under section 1050 now uh, one way of looking at it is if one looks at the wordings of uh, the provisions of section 1050 it says that the exemption would be available provided uh, the transaction is subject to equalization levy so it it kind of indicates that you would probably need to test where in 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 the next year whether the transaction is subject to equalization levy if it is subject to equalization levy then possibly you can argue that there is no requirement for undertaking a withholding tax so um so you would have this situation and uh, one would really need to see how the entire distribution arrangement is uh, is undertaken between the foreign company and indian company if if the contracts are done offline there may be some room to say that uh, the equalization levy may not really apply um, if it is if it is a direct online to online uh, transaction we might have the the levy apply to us so therefore one would really need to see how this pans out in 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 a reseller model another um, element of the equalization levy is in the context of social media platforms um now if you see uh, a social media platform um, a lot of so just to give an example 
it would be a case where you're you're surfing the internet you're on a social media platform or twitter or a facebook and uh, suddenly you will see ads popping out where it says if you're interested in buying a property in dubai or looking at buying expensive watches and those ads suddenly start popping up um that now the entire levy seeks to even capture such transactions where it says that if there is um uh, a transaction between two non residents uh, and two non residents for placing advertisements and those advertisements are really targeting an indian customer then how would the then that would also be subject to equalization levy now having said that one would really need to see how would um, how does one determine whether the advertisement was for targeting users in india because if you look at the 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 social media platforms uh, when you go to place ads there are options available where an ad could just be generally placed and there could also be options where you can do a customization of your ad programs when you do a customization of your ad programs um, it really depends on what sort of customization you are looking at uh, there could be uh situations where you might want to do a global ad uh, program targeting various uh, various geographies and not necessarily india related um in such situations how would even you imagine computing the levy and even figuring out whether this program is uh, targeting indian consumers um there and and a lot of the social media platforms actually say that they don't they are not involved in selling of any data and the data that they have is probably bundled as part of the ad program it could uh, just be as as saying that okay this program is um, is is targeted towards targeting um uh 3 million uh, millennials across the globe now in that sort of situation how would you say that the levy can apply um does that mean that you will really need to see how much of it um how how much uh, of it pertains to india that data could be really difficult for for a for a platform to figure out um it could actually mean that one would really need to look at the the the, the number of clicks that have happened from a particular jurisdiction and then work out the the levy um there could also be situations where Uh, there is already an equalization levy pay, paid under EL1 where you pay a 6% equalization levy so you would need to really segregate between uh, between the two levies so there could be a lot of challenges for a social media platform to figure out how much of it can be said is targeting um, a user in india um sure if there is a specific program which says that you are looking at targeting 30000 users in india the job is much more easier but for a global audience for a global outreach it may be very difficult and to 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 say that the program is for targeting users in india so that's that's another example of how you would see it in the context of uh, uh, social media the if you look at the next model this is the marketplace model for goods and services um clearly the levy was brought it has been brought with the intent of targeting um many of such um, such operators you 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 today have a wide gamut of such um, operators where you can uh, where you where you speak to, where you can actually buy uh, goods from outside of india using these platforms there are many online courses that you can really um access from from such um, uh, from such operators so the levy is targeted towards such operators now the typical model in this this these kind of uh, uh marketplace models would involve listing of um of uh, the goods or the services on the platform and the platform really acts as a facilitator between the between the vendors and a customer base situated in india or across geographies um that so the so if you so the issues that you would have is that you'd have a customer place an order on on these platforms and then the goods are delivered services are rendered by the third party vendors 
if you look at the way the levy has been brought in, it is payable at 2% of the consideration received or receivable. Now, in the context of an e-commerce operator, if you look at the very definition of an e-commerce operator, it talks about uh, a non-resident operator, which is facilitating uh, the sale of goods or services. So therefore, can somebody say that the 2% levy that needs to be that needs to be discharged is only in connection with the facilitation service that is rendered by the non-resident e-commerce operator? Um, well, but that that is possibly an interpretation that one could take. Um, if you look at it, um, the, the of experience of other countries, I have seen, for example, the United Kingdom, they have uh, what they call the DST, the digital service tax. Um, in fact, if you look at the UK DST provisions, they have very well defined what is the meaning of an online marketplace, an online social media platform. Uh, they've also issued exhaustive guidance and on how you compute the, the DST. Um, in, in the context of, uh, of a marketplace model, uh, the guidance that it gives is that you really need to look at the, the accounting uh, principle and policy that is followed by such players. Um, and as long as they follow um, the IFRS um, accounting system for revenue recognition, the revenues that are reported by uh, under the IFRS could be used as a base for, for paying the digital service tax. Now, if you look at a lot of the um, uh, marketplace, online marketplace models, uh, they follow the IFRS and under the IFRS, what they record is only the, the, the facilitation or the net consideration that they receive for the activities that they undertake. So, uh, UK is, is possibly an example. Today, the way the, the law is worded, there is no clarity on whether the 2% applies on, on a cross or a net. There are arguments that can be taken for saying that it should be on a net basis. Um, there are also issues on how do you really deal with, um, uh, with, how do you deal with adjustment of refunds, returns, um, cashback discounts, because all of this is not really factored it into the levy. Maybe the way to look at it is once the returns for, um, for the equalization levy are provided, um, they, would, they would provide some sort of mechanism to, to address adjustment for returns. It could also be that you, since the returns may be required to be filed on a quarterly basis, we can adjust it on a quarter to quarter basis. Um, and whether that would include another aspect is whether that consideration would even include taxes. Um, one interesting element that comes in is that you could have a lot of the e-commerce operator, which really acts as an aggregator. And there are many other multiple e-commerce operators, which are, which are involved in it. Um, in that sort of situation, how would the equalization levy apply? Is, is something which needs to be considered. Um, and it really depends on how the transaction flows are, are being undertaken. So if there is a, a platform which is being utilized by, by another e-commerce operator um, and, and that e-commerce operator effects uh, is listing a number of other e-commerce operators, in that situation, uh, how would the levy work? It would depend on who is receiving the payment and how the payment mechanisms are flowing in the entire transaction. Depending on that, one will really need to see on how the levy would apply. Um, another aspect of the levy is that how would it really apply uh, in, the con in the context of streaming of content? So, uh, like I explained, there was, um, you know, you, you're seeing a lot of, um, uh, uh, a lot of entertainment now being available on the OTT platforms in the pandemic. I'm sure these, 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 uh, platforms are, where are, are, are doing great business, uh, where there is, where, where, um, a lot of content is available and a lot of users are, uh, accessing this content. Um, 
in, in, and if you see the typical model that is being followed in such cases is that you have um, uh, the foreign entity and that foreign entity has a mixed bag where it actually owns some content or it also has the right to license the, con uh, by the content by entering into arrangement with, with, with content uh, creators. Um, and it has an Indian company or an Indian entity with which it enters into a distribution arrangement and that distribution arrangement um, is, is generally concluded offline. Uh, the Indian entity in turn earns uh, subscription revenues from a customer base in India. So in many cases, if you go for a lot of the subscriptions to these online, uh, to the online, uh, you know, OTT platforms, you actually get a receipt from, uh, from an Indian company, from an Indian LLP. Now in that sort of a situation, how would you see the levy really apply? Um, can one really say that uh, the arrange, the, the, the payment is received by the Indian company uh, LLP? Um, and the Indian LLP pays to the foreign company for the distribution arrangement that is there. And that distribution arrangement is entered offline. So if it is an offline activity, if therefore it need not be subjected to the equalization levy. Now, but another way of looking at it is that um, it is the foreign entity, which is an e-commerce operator, and it is actually involved in facilitating an online provision of entertainment services to Indian users. So if, if it is in the nature of a facilitation of such online provision, it could well be subject to um, an equalization levy. So it, one would really need to look at the nature of the arrangement that has entered into, um, but it is, uh, you know, in the absence of any clear guidelines, this could be, uh, a huge issue for a lot of the um, online, um, you know, over the uh, OTT platforms, which are uh, which are offering uh, streaming con streaming of content in India. Yeah, we did speak about how the levy would apply um, in the case of online provision of services um, and and online sale of goods. Another example could also be how would it work in an offline provision of services? Like for example, um, while today is not the right uh, time for me to travel, but yes, maybe a year down the line, I, I think I if I want to travel to the US and I access um, um, one of the international hotels or a Marriott to book a hotel for my stay in, in, in the US, um, would, would is so when I am making a booking on a Marriott US website and I use the website for booking my hotel room, is that what is subject to an equalization levy? If you look at it, the hotel website is owned and managed by the overseas hotel. So it probably falls within the definition of an e-commerce operator. Um, but is the hotel really involved in providing online services and what is the service for which I have paid for? Uh, as a user, I have paid for the service of utilizing a hotel room and that hotel room service that the hotel offers to me is a service which is offered to me offline. So my limited usage of the platform is only for getting a booking and not for really utilizing the services. So can one argue that that use of the platform is not for a conclusion of an offline, is not for a conclusion of an online service, but it is only for facilitating an offline service. So therefore, uh, a for, for such services, the equalization levy should not apply. Um, if you look at even the, uh, you know, when the e-commerce uh, taxation, when the equalization levy was brought about in 2016. Uh, there were exclusions that were brought about for hospitality services. Um, and in the report of, uh, uh, of the committee on e-commerce, there was a clear exclusion for, for hotel services, et cetera. Um, so if I look at that, 
there may be a room to argue that uh, such offline services may not be subjected to the equalization levy. Uh, so that's an and and this is not really restricted only to hotels. It could apply to even um, airlines and many other uh, many other such services. So that's another example of how we see uh, the levy impacting and the issues arising from it. Uh, the last one which I would see is that how do you see it from from for intercompany arrangements? You have situations where uh, you know, a lot of foreign companies have cross-charge arrangements with their Indian subsidiaries. And the cross-charge covers a, huge, a, a variety of services. It could cover HR, legal, um, your IT services, and, um, and, and, and treasury. And a lot of them actually are, are nothing but merely um, uh, a, a recovery or a reimbursement of all the expenses that the foreign company is that has the foreign company has incurred for providing um, uh, the, the the all the services to 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 the group entities. Um, even if you see uh, from from an IT service perspective, it could very well be the case that the foreign company is not really providing any service. The service is provided through um, an IT service provider. Um, or, or the platform of the IT service provider. Uh, the IT service provider could actually be uh, simply just uh, responding to queries and resolving queries of the uh, Indian, you know, of the subsidies or of the group entities and the foreign company pays uh, to the IT service provider and then cross charges it to the group. If you look at those type of arrangements, can the equalization levy really apply in such intercompany arrangements? Uh, Again, if you look at it, one can say that who is the e-commerce operator out here? The e is it the foreign company which is the e-commerce operator or is it really the IT service provider which is the e-commerce operator? Because the services are all rendered directly by the e-commerce operator, by, by the IT service provider. Again, the IT service provider does not receive any consideration from the user in India. It receives all its consideration from the foreign con from from the foreign company for rendering the services so therefore can it be said that the equalization levy should not apply in such cases um, and and even if we were to take such a view you would actually need to look at the entire cross charge arrangement and and um, probably carve out um, elements of such services which should not be subject to the equalization levy um, so, so that, that's one aspect which one would really need to sit and analyze. Um, in many of such cases, you would see that the equalization uh, levy is applicable for online uh, conclusion of sales and services. In many of such cases, you have the cross-charge agreement itself uh, concluded offline. So when you have an offline uh, conclusion of contract, but the services are provided through some platform or or through through use of uh, uh, technology, then whether this could be subject to the equalization levy. So uh, this these are some of the critical um, business models that we are seeing uh, where the equalization levy could really apply um, uh, in in a wide range of activities. Uh, having said that, there are certain other aspects which may, which one would really, really need to focus on. One is how, how you know, the equalization levy today has the government has the way it has been brought about. If you see that the committee of e-commerce e taxation, it says that the e-commerce uh, or the equalization levy is not really in the nature of an income tax, uh, but it is in the nature of a tax on uh, certain services. So therefore an issue arises of whether one can get a credit of such equalization levy in the home jurisdiction, because for a non-resident, um, if the non-resident has to discharge the equalization levy, whether a credit of the, of the equalization levy is available in the home jurisdiction. I think a lot of the foreign companies would need to do that analysis to see whether this tax is creditable 
in the overseas jurisdiction. If you look at the OECD model commentary, uh, which deals with, uh, which talks about the nature of taxes, it talks about uh, taxes which are probably similar or identical. Um, taxes are available, should be available as a credit. Um, having said that, if you look at the very context in which equalization levy has been brought in, it draws a lot of um, its meanings from the Income Tax Act. It is administered by uh, the provisions of um, uh, the Income Tax Act. Uh, the administration is handled all by the Income Tax Act. So uh, maybe there may be some room to say that this is again in the nature of an Income Tax Act and a credit may be available in the overseas jurisdiction. Um, another aspect is how do you see uh, the, the, the levy apply? So, uh, you know, we had, we, we could have imagine a situation where you enroll for um, an online course and you, as part of your new year resolution, you applied for those courses in the beginning of Jan 2020 and you made an advance payment and uh, the services of the online course are going to be rendered throughout the year. In that sort of a situation, would you say that equalization levy would really apply to you uh, because there is a receipt of consideration uh, or a part provision of services which has actually happened before April 2020? If you look at the way uh, the provisions are worded, it says that the, that the levy really applies on or from 1st of April 2020 for the consideration that is received on or after 2020, 1st April 2020. So there might, be a, there might be a case to argue that since the levy was only to apply after uh, 1st April 2020, any advance that has been received is is um, uh, may may not be subject to the equalization levy. So one would really need to look at even arrangements where you have made part payments, where you've made advance payments. So this is one aspect which one will need to consider. Again, when you see how do you really compute the consideration, um, because the levy is to be discharged out here in India, um, what would be the forex conversion that we need to take? In the context of income tax, you've had rule 115, where uh, th there are, you know, the exchange rates to be used on what date has been expressly provided for. Um, but how do you really look at it in the context of equalization levy? Because the transactions happen all around the year. So, uh, and if you have to make a quarterly payment, is it that what sort of exchange rate would you really need to apply? This also needs to be somewhere clarified by the government. Another aspect in the levy has been um, the practical challenges that one will have for effecting the payments. The, you know, uh, the Chalans just got notified on, on the 7th of July and the payment mechanisms are all through the Indian banks. So how would the foreign companies really enable payment of the equalization levy um, through through uh, the through an Indian bank, they would really need to work out some processes for effecting such payment, uh, which again needs to be uh, clarified. Um, if you if one concludes that yes, the equalization levy is applicable, the e-commerce operator actually needs to go and obtain a perm a permanent account number, as all the payments have to be made uh, through. Uh, through through a pan, so the it would I, you know a lot of the e-commerce operators would need to evaluate whether they are comfortable obtaining a permanent account number for for and register as such for uh, in for for the equalization levy. So that's one aspect which everyone will need to look at from a resident perspective. Um, a lot of residents would when they are making payments especially from a withholding tax perspective, would need to evaluate on their level of comfort for making uh, whether, you know, what sort of documentation should they get from a non-resident to from an equalization levy perspective. 
So uh, you would have seen, you know, many non-residents when we're making payments to non-residents, we take a declaration to say um, that the non-resident doesn't have a permanent establishment in India. Would a similar declaration would is 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 sufficient from for uh, from a withhold from a equalization levy perspective? Um, again, uh, you know, if we can, if we're comfortable with a no PE undertaking, would we would a pair be comfortable with uh, uh, with an equalization levy undertaking? This may not be very relevant at this year, but if you look at it, probably in the next year, when you when when if a payment is covered by equalization levy, it would not be subject to withholding tax. Therefore, one would really need to evaluate what sort of documentation you would really need to look at. Um, is that that somebody that that a resident payer needs to obtain uh, appropriate indemnities from uh, the non-resident? You know, to protect from any withholding uh, tax default. That's also something which a resident payer will need to think through. Um, again, there is a overall threshold of uh, two crores, which, which would be, which has been provided. And uh, how would one really need to, you know, have comfort that the threshold of two crores will be crossed in a year, not be crossed in a year. Uh, these are also some of the issues that one would really need to uh, evaluate and look at. Um, so these, so this is all the broad issues that we see around with the levy. Um, if we look at the entire uh, assessment procedures and appeals, um, a lot of unlike equalization levy one, the the a responsibility or the obligation to discharge the levy is on the non-resident. However, you have, uh, there are other provisions of the Income Tax Act which can apply for this and it could be recovery could be possible from the e-commerce operator uh, by resorting to the representative assessee provisions. Um, so therefore, this means that uh, it, the, the, the authorities could effectively even uh, recover the equalization levy from the resident payers uh, under the representative SSE provisions. However, there are no specific provisions that have been provided for passing an order. So if there are no specific provisions, you can arguably say that there is no recourse available with the tax authorities for recovering taxes. So that's one aspect which one could could evaluate. Um, although this is uh, way way ahead when when this moves into an assessment appeal stage. Um, again, there is no real timeline prescribed for initiation of um, uh, or completion of assessment proceedings. There are no appeal mechanisms which are provided. Uh, there is only an appeal that you can file against a penalty order. So writ petition before the high court is possibly the only um, option that, uh, that a pair could, that, that an, uh, an e-commerce operator or a pair could look at while, while uh, if there is any challenge on, on the equalization levy. Um, there is no real option since the equalization levy is covered under a separate um, uh, chapter under the Finance Act may not really be possible for a non-resident to approach the uh, AR to get a, a ruling. Um, one could evaluate whether you would want to go approach the AR for determining if there is an income exempt under uh, uh, under the Income Tax Act. Um, so so that that's on the on if it is possible to really approach for an AR. Um, so this is broadly on how the assessment appeal related provisions are. Um, in terms of the way forward, I think it would be very, very important for the businesses to undertake an impact analysis and to see whether which entity could fall within the definition of an e-commerce operator. One would need to really evaluate their models and arrangements um, for with with, with uh, across with with Indian customers with Indian companies, and then determine which transactions could be covered under the levy. Um, 
another aspect of ensuring compliance with the levy would involve obtaining tax registrations uh, how do you really collate a data how do you put in requisite uh, infrastructure systems this would also mean that you know you would have e-commerce operators would now need to evaluate whether a person transacting with them is a resident in india and so what sort of changes will they need to do in their systems to really record this kind of data um it's equally important for uh, payers and e-commerce operators to look at that what on a kind of advocacy that one could go for on various aspects of the levy uh, because the way the levy has been brought about and there is so much ambiguity around it it's very important to um, to to look at how this could impact uh, businesses as whole well. and if you look at the intent versus the legal framework and the uncertainty around it it is very important to to make appropriate representations on several aspects of the levy um the last aspect would really be on 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 challenging the constitutional validity before the courts and whether one would really want to go down the route of uh, challenging the constitutional validity uh, is 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 something which all businesses or need to evaluate um i think that's that's all that um, we had to to talk about on the levy um i if there are any questions or anything ajay uh, i would, you know my colleague ajay is also there we would be happy to uh uh address a few of the questions that people may have around the levy um are there any questions that we can see on the screen just why can you uh there are there is one interesting question rishi i think we should take that which is if service agreements or contracts are circulated why why are emails and then you obtain the party signature on email does it mean that the agreement contracts are concluded online and therefore a 2% equalization levy applies if contracts are circulated on email and uh, you know signed on uh, electronically on the emails so i think there the most important thing is uh, you know how do you see the definition of uh, a platform and how do you see what an e-commerce operator is and a e-commerce operator will be someone who is owning operating or managing a facility or a platform for online sale of goods now one could definitely argue that you having a facility of email is not for the purpose of online sale of goods and then you know you have a for example most of the uh, uh, companies today would have a website which will say for any orders or any details about this contact so and so email address it could be there for services uh, goods whatever now does that necessarily mean that that is an online facility for the purpose of sale of goods or services and if it is you know if you can establish that that's not for the purpose of sale but it's a procedure it's a way that you actually collect the orders i think we could still apply that uh, you know you will not be a operator because this is not for the purposes of sale and uh, therefore it applies not to operate. yeah so uh, uh, prishi there's another question uh, you know i'll just uh, put it up and if you could take that which is do you think yeah. indian authority would take a position that 2% equalization levy would apply and therefore relieve one of the a liability to deduct tax at 10% on royalty or fees for technical services that you've been incurring for years i cannot imagine that that would be a possible result because yeah. this is to collect more tax and not less tax so essentially would a equalization levy absolve somebody of a withholding under 10% uh, for royalty or fts yeah i think ajay that's a very interesting question i think lot of lot of them would there would be so many situations where you would have a royalty fts taxation uh, and that would be subject to an income tax withholding um, so is it are we saying that the 10% or a 2% is is there a flexibility of choosing that option um, well i think if you look at the way the levy is worded or you know the provisions are worded uh, in terms of an income tax exemption 
it actually says that if something is subject to an equalization levy, then it would be exempt. So a reading of the law really suggests that um, if you're covered under equalization levy, you should not be subject to a withholding tax. Um, but however, saying that uh, what we've heard of the tax authorities or whatever we've heard in some public forums, they have uh, said that, you know, uh, it's not 10 versus two. It is you either, uh, it is the reverse. So, uh, uh, the and, and, and uh, if I may come in, uh, Rishi, it yeah. is more likely to be 10 and two uh, than anything else, if yeah. you know. So yeah. I think it's the experience of the next one year, which will be assimilated by the government. Uh, clearly, there is a exemption for permanent establishment. So either you are business profits or you are equalization levy. You can't be both. But I don't think you are ever going to be exempted from royalties and fees for technical services. Rishi, the next question is whether the de minimis threshold of uh, you know uh, twenty million rupees is based on sale of e-commerce operator only for providing sales to Indian residents or IP located in India and not on global sales of the e-commerce operator. I think here, if we just look at uh, 165 capital A of Finance Act 16, which is where the charge of the levy comes in and there's subsection two, which excludes the levy. And there the clause actually says it's sales turnover or receipt of the e-commerce operator from supply or services provided or facilitated referred to in subsection one. So what is subsection one is to a person resident in India to IP in India and those specified circumstances that has to be less than two crore rupees or 20 billion during the previous year. So you will not take your global sales. You'll only take what otherwise would have been liable to equalization levy and that turnover has to be less than uh, two crores or 20 million rupees. Rishi, there's a question on, uh, you know, FTC which is basically is equalization levy in the nature of above the line or below the line. How would the non-resident taxpayer treat this? And this decision will have a bearing on FTC subject to DTS scope and coverage and deductibility and disclosure. Uh, I think that's a very important question on the availability of the tax credit. Um, I think as we spoke about it, uh, one would really need to evaluate how this will be seen from an overseas jurisdiction perspective. Um, if we see generally the OECD model commentary, it talks about, uh, uh, you know, taxes not really to be seen in the perspective of only income tax, but anything which is substantially similar to an income tax. Now, if you see the way the entire levy is structured and, uh, and the interconnection that it has with the income tax, there may be some uh, to argue to say that this is in the nature of an income tax and it should be creditable in the overseas jurisdiction. Uh, but it's something which, which is very important for uh, businesses to evaluate and you would need to really discuss it with the, uh, with, 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 uh, people outside in the home jurisdiction on how do they look at the equalization. Levy. Rishi, one, uh, uh, if I, I could, uh, sorry, if I could supplement what Rishi is saying, a couple of things. Uh, unlike the earlier 6% levy, this is the first time the levy is on the non-residents so earlier. On the 6%, we did not have to consider uh, creditability. Uh, second, uh, this speaks of a permanent establishment. So it does not apply where a permanent establishment is there. And therefore, is there a case to say that it so to say substitutes the business profits? And that could be a good argument. And finally, obviously, the next question is, is there enough of foreign tax credits available to absorb a, such a credit if at all that should be possible? Uh, a very, very important questions and a lot of work happening as we speak on this subject. Yes. Dinesh, uh, Rishi, I uh, agree with all of that. There's one added, uh, you know, additional angle here is that, you know, we also need to decide whether equalization levy gets covered under FIN 48 because FIN 48 is for uncertainty in income taxes. Now, if we take a position that equalization levy is a income tax or a tax in lieu of income tax, therefore credit, then would you then examine it and test it under FIN 48 for reserves for provisions? Would you apply your, uh, you know, MLTN shoot positions while you're taking a position on validity, constitutional validity, etc. Because that's another very important aspect, because if you don't apply the test of FIN 48 and it becomes not an income tax, then the test for recognition and provision are less stringent.
Yeah, Ajay, I think that's a very uh, interesting aspect on, on, on the way that you see the levy um, and, and, uh, uh, and, and whether this would really fit within uh, the perspective of the pain 48 perspective. Uh, very interesting element. And I would feel that you would really need to, um, with today the way the levy is really brought in and if the levy itself can be, is not constitutionally, you can challenge it on constitutional validity, on its ambiguity uh, and, and, you know, extraterritoriality, et cetera. It could be, uh, you know, the very levy per se is, is subject to challenge. So in that context, it can actually be, um, yeah, you know, whether this is something which you would bring within the scope of a FIN48 also is something which you would need to, uh, would need to look at. Uh, there's a question on uh, the order of how 1050 and uh, withholding tax applies. Uh, uh, let me just read that out. It is clear that there is an exemption under section 1050 for income which is subject to EL. But is there any exemption for the other way around? That is income which has been subjected to withholding tax. Is it exempt from EL from FI 21-22 onwards? No, I don't think there's a, there is a parallel exemption available under the equalization levy. The way it reads is if, if you're subject to an equalization levy, then you would, you, know, you can get an income tax exemption. I don't think it's the other way around. Uh, Rishi, another uh, interesting question. Once a taxpayer crosses the threshold of 2 million, would they be liable to equalization levy on the whole turnover or only the excess of 2 million? Uh, the, the way uh, it would, it says that if it is in excess of two crores, I think that's the only de minimis threshold that you, you need to cross. Once you cross more than two crores, then the levy would apply on the entire amount, on the entire consideration. It is not, it is not like a slab rate which is prescribed. So uh, as long as you cross the two crore threshold, you would be subject to the levy on the entire consideration. Are we through with the questions, uh, Ajay? Uh, Dinesh, there are a few more. Uh, I think uh, one is a uh, request for circulating the presentation. We will be circulating this presentation uh, to all the participants. There are, uh, you know, more than 50 questions that we have got. Some of it we will come back, uh, you know, uh, to the participants and uh, answer. I think that might be a better thing to do because yes. uh, each question may have a very uh, a specific need and we'll be very happy to uh, respond to you. Uh, rest assured that uh, it'll be our endeavor that every single question that has been raised uh, will reach out to you and email to you our responses uh, uh, if it is at all uh, practicable. Um, I, I think uh, with that, uh, uh, we should uh, call it an end to uh, this webinar. Uh, thank you, Rishi. Thank you, Ajay. I, I hope that for all of you who have participated, when you walk away from this, you would have got uh, uh, a, a fair degree of understanding, but more important than a fair degree of understanding, uh, you would have seen how what has begun as only a provision for applicability to e-commerce operators actually has a significantly wide ramification. We left you with what is the way forward, whether it is in terms of uh, uh, making representations, ensuring that uh, some of the questions are answered in an FAQ, the compliance which is required to be done, what is required to be done to do a deep, deep analysis. Uh, and I think it's very, very critical that we do that. Uh, uh, I think the last thing that we would want to do is to be in default of timelines and payment of uh, uh, a timeline which has already gone by. And the sooner we fall into that compliance zone, the better we are. Thank you so much all for participating. Uh, we enjoyed bringing this to you and I hope it was worth your while participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.